When this series started, it seemed clear that the Nets had the Bucks' number. But unfortunate injuries to two of their three stars decimated the rotations and their ability to score, not even breaking 90 points in two games and 100 in one, all losses. But thanks to an incredible performance from Kevin Durant, the Nets were right there, ready to win it all despite the Bucks' own stars playing well. And it all came down to a matter of inches. And when all was said and done, it was Milwaukee who had just a little bit more left in the tank to propel themselves to the Eastern Conference Finals. It was hard to predict who was going to win this game based on the up and down nature of the first six games. And even something as huge as home court advantage didn't seem like it would have an effect. However, the Nets did control this game for much of the first half, and it felt like the Bucks weren't going to solve their issues in time to win the game. While P.J. Tucker did use a lot of physicality to make KD work, it's hard to argue it was completely effective considering how easy it is for him to attack drop coverage, then pull up for a wide open three over the contest that is six inches too short. The Bucks adjust and bring Lopez up to stop the three-point shot as Tucker runs right into the screen. Great contest by a guy KD's size, but even that doesn't matter. The first half saw the Nets shoot 10 percentage points higher, with guys like Middleton unable to take advantage of the ailing Harden as part of a 2-for-11 stretch, and getting back in transition, Giannis doesn't sprint, then gets so focused on Durant despite two defenders surrounding him that he doesn't realize he's supposed to be covering Joe Harris, who hits the wide-open three. Milwaukee shot 30% from three over the whole series, with Brooklyn at 35%, and having hit more threes in every game but number four. With the ridiculous Giannis sag by Griffin, the Bucks' adjustment is to get Giannis attacking on the midline, which makes it hard for the defense to figure out which side is the weak side and who should rotate to help. As he drives right, Harris makes the mistake of helping one pass away off the corner. It's not only the easiest pass for Giannis to make, it's a wide open shot on the easiest three-pointer to make as well. It feels like offensive rebounds play an extra important role in most Game 7s, and the Bucks grabbed a whopping 18 of them, eight more than the regular season average. While this didn't affect the Nets as much as we had thought before the series started considering how many they usually give up, it bit them big time as the Bucks turned all those offensive rebounds into 22 second chance points. And when Giannis is getting into the act from behind the line, you might feel like this isn't going to go your way. We saw in Game 6 how the Bucks pushed the ball a lot more to get Giannis opportunities before the defense could sag. And the refs are generous with this call as it looks to me like Blake got himself in legal guarding position and Giannis instigates all the contact. And in true Baldo Live fashion, after taking over 10 seconds to receive the ball and 12 more seconds to violate the rule on shooting the free throw, he airballs this one. More ball don't lie, as he short arms the second one, but remember that offensive rebound count I was talking about? The Bucks must practice for his misses, as Lopez back taps it, and then Giannis almost charges again. More of a green flop, and to finish off this possession, Brooke Lopez travels before releasing this miss off the side of the backboard on his way to an awkward stumble to the ground. The Nets waste no time taking advantage of the 5-on-4, and Tucker is so busy pointing to Brown on the weak side, he doesn't realize that KD is wide open on the left wing until it's too late. For a shooter like this, even the late contest by Lopez doesn't have an effect. But it was the third quarter where the Bucks started asserting themselves more. Giannis brings it up, sees Blake giving him 10 feet of space, and with his eye gaze at the ground into the last second, pulls up for a wide-open 15-footer to cut the lead to four. It was in the third quarter when the Bucks' offense perked up, with Giannis leading the way at 6 for 10 from the field, and the key was how comfortable he felt on the court. When you've got that feeling, you can accomplish practically anything, and it's the same kind of feeling when you use Manscaped's whole line of grooming tools for the modern man. By being properly trimmed, everything seems to flow that much better, and the newly designed Lawnmower 4.0 is truly breathtaking. Skin safe technology which reduces nicks and cuts. Cordless and waterproof, trim in the shower with no mess. Wireless charging with 90 minutes of use on a single charge. You think Giannis made this shot because he practiced it a lot? Eh, maybe, but it's much more likely he's confident, smooth, and comfortable, knowing that this lawnmower has a travel lock feature. No more embarrassing buzzing in your bag. Get 20% off plus free international shipping when you click on my special link in the description below. 
Do it now and you'll find out how the Bucks continue to take control of this game. Besides their grooming, they kept grabbing more offensive rebounds. On the Middleton curl, he catches Brown rubbed off by the screen, and because Blake likes to sag so low against Giannis, he's now stuck too far from Middleton to contest. They dodge the bullet, but the long rebound goes right to the Greek Freak, making P.J. Tucker Harden's man. But with his bad hamstring, he won't even pretend to close out to the corner, as the Bucks hit three more threes in this game, and they were all crucial. This game was decided in the closing minutes as the score seesawed back and forth throughout the fourth quarter. They run Drew off an Iverson cut across the free throw line. Notice how Connaughton turns around and then screens for Giannis, which triggers a switch and a mismatch. On the drive to the middle, it seems clear to me that Giannis lands before releasing his pass. But the refs miss the travel call, and then Drew Holiday takes the ball to the baseline, elevates, and he definitely lands before releasing the pass, but again, no call. Brown had to bump down to Lopez before closing back out and can't get there in time as Middleton barely gets his toe behind that line on a catch and shoot to cut the lead to two. I've been advocating for more Middleton guarding Durant since I think he's got the best chance at affecting the shot. And that bears out as he's physical with him on the catch, then squeaks by the ball screen. Lopez had dropped out of the play, but Middleton is long and is the only guy who can bother KD's high release. Giannis then sets a good screen on Harden to spring Drew loose on Blake. Good pocket pass, and though KD was rotating over, although a step slow, I love how Giannis plants that left foot down on the catch and then need only take a quick step with the right to drift to his right for the layup and score. But it's time to talk offensive rebounds again. First off, what's wrong with this picture? Oh yeah, why the heck is KD on the perimeter while one-legged Harden is boxing out on the lane line? He gets pushed under the basket and allows a tap back. While the Nets get into good position as they scramble to recover, Joe Harris lets his defensive slides take him too low, needing a big left foot plant to push off while Drew hops into a quick release to get himself out of a nasty shooting slump. Middleton gets another crack at KD, and the crossover into drive makes him turn and run alongside, but faked off his feet with the pump before rising up for an open 13-footer. Game 7s might not always have regressions to the mean due to the immense pressure, but Drew Holiday was 4 for 20 at this point and his confidence was shot. But afraid of the pocket pass to Giannis, Blake continues to sag into the lane, opening up a wide open shot from 15 feet. The Nets run an inverted pistol action. It's not quite organized, but watch how Joe Harris gets there to set the cross screen for KD before Blake hands off to him. By the way, this is as close to being a backcourt violation as you can get with KD's foot looking like it's on that midline. But Lopez knows right away there's no way he can contain Durant in this position. Giannis is a step late rotating over. It would have been a layup for Brown, but KD isn't taking any chances. This got eyebrow raising as KD attacks PJ Tucker, who's got five fouls, and you can see him clearly whack Durant across the forearm. Perhaps it was loud in the arena and the slot official right there didn't hear it or see it, but this leads to the nice steal from Middleton, who pushes the ball up court before stumbling into Harden, who should be entitled to his position but coaxes two free throws out of the ref. We need some lip readers, but you can clearly see KD tell Tucker, hey, you fouled me. Then Tucker says something back. Then you guard me tight. Mayonnaise. Okay, I'm not an expert lip reader, but down four, they attack Lopez again, but why does KD double pump this shot? He had the step he needed, but interrupts his rhythm and lets Tucker get underneath him on the shot that misses. He makes up for it with a simple drive to the right, and you almost wonder why the Nets just didn't clear out for this shot every single possession all game long. Needing only a stop and a score to tie or win, the Bucks resort to a Middleton Giannis pick and roll that can't get a clean look. But there's another one of those pesky offensive rebounds that decides tough game sevens. There's still enough time for the Nets to get a stop, and Drew risks a drive to the hoop knowing the refs are going to swallow their whistles and not call anything short of a jailable offense. Good hands by Blake gives the Bucks one more chance. I really don't know why they ran Brooke Lopez to the corner off the screen with less than two seconds on the clock. Not sure what they thought was going to happen, setting the Nets and KD up for what was already the end of the series. With six seconds to go, down by two, the Nets have to get going right away. Once the clock gets close to around three seconds, there's no time to make a pass and get a good look, so doubling Durant should have been on the table. This kind of defense isn't bad, but when Tucker simply cannot elevate to contest his shots, it's a bit strange they allowed it to happen like this. One issue is that the spacing was good for the Nets. Hard to leave your man to go double without giving something easy up. 
But had Durant worn one size smaller shoe, we'd be celebrating the greatest Game 7 shot of all time, hands down. Instead, these two exhausted teams had to do it for another five minutes after Giannis comically hits the side of the shot clock on this one. Late in OT, with the Nets down two, this was the game right here. Middleton leads KD right into a Giannis sandwich. Connaughton allows easy middle penetration. Maybe this is a shot, but certainly Blake should not be backing up. He should be cutting in for the layup, but they still get a wide open three for Harden. He bricks it to the left, and then taking advantage of a five on three, it's hard to believe Giannis would put himself in this situation where he bowls Blake Griffin over. I mean, I still can't figure out why this wasn't called a charge. There is a bit of a flop with the head throwback, but it's still a lot of contact by the upper arm right into Blake's chest. But credit KD for the great hands to tie up Lopez with the jump ball. The Bucks reset, and credit to Giannis for being aggressive despite the very real threat of putting his broke shot back on the free throw line. But he completely fumbles the left-handed spin move dribble, and is lucky that it bounced off of KD's big feet. But that didn't deter him, and he redeems himself with a strong move to the middle against Durant, tossing in the jump hook to tie the game. KD is hounded by Middleton all the way up the floor. Both these guys have to be utterly exhausted, but Hezzy's his way to a lefty drive. He doesn't recognize Lopez full rotating until it's too late. He had Jeff Green wide open in the corner, Brown rolling to the basket, but opts for an off-foot lefty layup, which gets unceremoniously sent back by the excellent block of Lopez. However, the offensive rebound goes right to Joe Harris for what could have been the beginning of the end for the Bucks. But true to form, Harris shot below 33% from behind the arc and is off several inches to the left. This time, the Bucks go back to the Middleton Giannis pick and roll out top. Nothing fancy, and watch how he ends the dribble with a 1-2 to establish his right foot as the pivot. This allows him to turn over his right shoulder to fade away from the defender. His shooting hip and elbow are now automatically aligned to the hoop, and the easy 13-footer spells the beginning of the end. I think P.J. Tucker fouling out was a good thing for the Bucks, forcing Budenholzer to guard Durant with Middleton instead. I can't say this was an incredible contest, but it did the job as KD misses an easy bucket. The Bucks go to the same Milton Giannis pick and roll again, this time on the left side, and Brown is able to contest the miss. To call timeout or not to call timeout, that is the question. I get not wanting to let the defense set up, and with KD, you've got the ultimate shot creator against a defense that won't throw an immediate double team. Remember, when you're down, you want to go as quickly as you can. But why didn't they set a quick drag screen with Connaughton's man? Green should have been at half court with 10 seconds to go, forcing that switch and letting KD go to work. Instead, he's got Drew Holiday out top. He's scored on him over and over on the right block, but not out top. And when he turns to fire another long two, he's got no lift. He can't get alignment over his left shoulder from that distance. And that's it. The Bucks did what they had to do to grit this one out and give credit to them for moving on. While I don't think anyone would argue Milwaukee wins against the full strength Nets or even two thirds strength, Injuries happen to teams all the time, and that can't be an excuse. I can't quite tell if this will catapult the Bucks to the NBA Finals, or if some of their issues will come back to bite them. The Hawks are also a team that is shorthanded, down a starter, but they do have players that match up okay with the Bucks. So, we should get a very competitive Eastern Conference Finals.